Okay, everybody, welcome to the next class session on altruism and economics. And this one, we're going to be talking about this concept of supply and demand as it relates to altruistic opportunities. This is going to be a counterintuitive notion at first, but once you get your brain hooked into it, you'll realize it actually sheds a lot of really cool insight and it relates to the reading that was assigned for this class session. I want to make sure we dig into this a little bit because there's some really cool ideas in this. And then we're going to illustrate some of the benefits of altruism, how, how there are ways in which altruism is actually economically superior behavior given certain conditions. We're going to talk about how it establishes new Nash equilibria. We're going to talk about how it lowers transaction costs and why it satisfies something called Rosenberg's rule. So let's start with the supply and demand discussion. Now this, like I said, is a counterintuitive way of thinking, but I want to make sure we, we dig into it a little bit because it really helps I think especially nonprofit managers reconsider how they approach their work on a day-to-day -day basis. So here I've got some roughly drawn supply and demand curves. Um, we've talked about supply and demand before in class and why the supply curve is upward sloping and the demand curve is downward sloping. But the product we're talking about here, instead of talking about widgets or iPhones or something else, here what we're going to talk about is what this author called altruistic opportunities. An altruistic opportunity is essentially a chance for someone to buy altruism, meaning to purchase some good being done in the world. So it might be funding immunizations. It might be, um, uh, uh, you know, supplying books uh, to kids who um, don't have access to, to books. Um, it might be, uh, you know, uh, funding an organization that does marriage counseling. So it would provide more marriage counseling. I'm, I'm just, these are ideas just popping off the top of my head, but you get the idea. Every time a donor makes a donation, one way we can think about it is they're actually purchasing an opportunity to be altruistic. And so these altruistic opportunities have a market, right? They'd have a supply and demand. And there are a couple of things we'd learn about this. First of all, the, the demand for altruistic opportunities is downward sloping. What that means is as, altruist, as opportunities for altruism get cheaper, more people will want to buy them. If immunizing one child from um, some basic communicable diseases cost $100,000 each, you wouldn't have very many people buying them simply because they can't afford it. But if immunizing a child costs just five cents a piece, a lot more people will fund that activity. And so that means more people will buy it. And that's why the demand curve for altruism is downward sloping. Um, the supply curve is upward sloping, meaning that the more of this you do, the more expensive it becomes. And using immunizations as an example there, you know, supplying immunization to a kid who lives in an urban area is less expensive than the immunization that has to go out to some very remote rural area. And so the more of these you do, the more expensive they are to provide. And so that's why the supply curve is upward sloping. So the first point is that the cost of altruistic opportunities is what determines the slope of the curve. The more expensive they are over time, the, the harder, the, the more of them that will be out of reach of donors because donors want cheaper altruistic opportunities. Um, this also means that in every market there's always unmet demand, an implication we'll discuss more in class, but it basically means there are people who will would be generous if the price of the good being done was a little bit cheaper. And then the last insight is where the really cool uh, like benefit of this model comes from, which is that sometimes people who manage a nonprofit worry that donors want the wrong things. That's a, that's a concept we're going to dig into deeply in class discussion because I feel like it's such a dangerous concept for nonprofit managers to rely on. If donors, the idea is that if donors would just want different things, the world would be a better place. And I'm going to challenge that thought because the problem is when nonprofit managers think about this, they think more about changing donors rather than improving the work that they do. And, and that's, a, that's, a, that's a wrong way to go about running an organization. You should be thinking about improving what you do or in the context of this model, you should be finding out, figuring out a way to lower the, to, to, to lower the supply curve, meaning to drive it down to the right. Because if you do that, you're able to provide more altruism at a cheaper price. And again, this may still feel a little counterintuitive, but we're going to dig into it in class. 
the type there are different ways of thinking about the slope of the supply curve like the what the managers are producing in terms of altruistic opportunities um, we can look at it from the angle of price we can look at it from the angle of value we can look at how accessible you make it to the donors and then we can also look at the elasticity or in other terms how well we can substitute between things and I'll give you examples of those where really managers are facing practical dilemmas here not moral quandaries about uh, how to get donors to change their minds so we're going to start again with this point that suppliers of altruistic opportunities should primarily focus on the supply curve they shouldn't be trying to change what donors want they should instead be trying to provide donors more of what they want for cheaper this would mean reducing the prices <clears throat> improving availability increasing the value and increasing elasticity why a donor gives should only be an important factor if it improves any of the supply curve factors. So let's give you some examples. In terms of price, this would mean a community nonprofit solicits three times as many donors as the previous year, but they reduce the suggested gift by half. This is a way to change the price and you get more donors and maybe a more efficient outcome. In terms of availability, you make access to don donating ch uh, faster and cheaper. Um, rather than making them dig through your website to find a way to donate. For example, when the Red Cross launched uh, text-based donations for the Earth in response to the, to the Haiti earthquake, it completely changed the landscape of fundraising, and they raised over a billion dollars. It is a historic fundraising campaign. You can also change the way you think about the value and provide more value. We talked last class session about the idea of warm glow. Well, you could increase the warm glow for your donors by having, for example, an awards and auction banquet. And then finally, elasticity. When it comes to supply, another way to think about it is substitutability, meaning how easily can you change what you do into other programs or altruistic opportunities. And here an example of that would be a health-focused nonprofit that develops a system of doing health trainings on demand. And so you can do health trainings anywhere you want to and whenever you want to rather than requiring people to come to your facility. And a change like that increases the, improves the elasticity of this as, a, as, a, as an altruistic opportunity and now all of a sudden you might be able to do a lot more of it. So we're going to discuss these questions in class. I won't dig into them now, um, but uh, there will be some interesting insights from it. Okay, so now I want to talk about the second part of this class session, which is why altruism is economically superior at times over self-interest. And one of them will be illustrated in a game we're going to play together in class called The Prisoner's Dilemma. And uh, don't worry too much about the scoring table. I'll explain this more, but this is a traditional scoring table for The Prisoner's Dilemma game. What you'll learn in class is we're going to demonstrate why altruistic behavior overcomes the worst outcome, Nash equilibria. Um, and so... This is the worst outcome, which we'll explain, but I'm putting in the recording here so you can have it as a refresher. And that's all I have right now to say about the prison's dilemma. So let's talk about the second of the three things, which is that altruism uh, is more efficient because it reduces transaction costs. So a transaction cost is the cost of doing business or uh, the cost of purchasing something outside of the purchase price itself. My favorite example of this is to buy groceries. The cost of your groceries is the amount you pay at the register. The transaction cost of your groceries is the time and money spent to get to the grocery store. So you have to spend a little bit on gas, wear and tear on your car, time that you could have been working that you're going to the grocery store instead. All of these costs are part of buying your groceries, even though they don't actually buy your groceries. You have to pay for the groceries at the register, but you won't even have the opportunity to pay for your groceries if you don't spend the time and money to get there. The time and money you spend to get there is the transaction cost. And altruism can actually reduce transaction costs. And Richard Titmus, who's an economist, wrote this great book called The Gift Relationship. And he did some cool research about blood donations back in the 70s in the UK and the United States. And what was different about blood donations back then is that if you were a blood donor in the UK, it works like it does now in the US, you just do it out of the goodness of your heart. You might get a cookie or a t-shirt, but generally speaking, you're not being paid to donate blood. Whereas if you donate, if back in the 70s, if you donated blood in the United States, you were probably being compensated for the blood that you donated. I mean, you, you were being paid cash. 
And what Tim has found is what we had the really cool idea was that in the UK and in the US during the same time period, there was the same base rate of hepatitis infection, meaning that um, meaning that the same percentage of the population was infected with hepatitis. And so what he decided to do was to see, do we get a different set of infected donations um, where one group is donating out of charity and the other group is donating because they're being paid. <clears throat> and as you suspect, he what he found is that in the United States where donors were being compensated, about 3.5% of the blood supply was infected with hepatitis. But during that same time period where you had, and with the same base rate of hepatitis infection, but in the UK where donors were doing it out of out of charity, less than 1% of the blood supply was infected with hepatitis. All of that donated blood is a transaction cost. It makes it more expensive for the Red Cross or other organizations to collect blood if after testing it, they have, screening it, they have to throw it away. And so it's more efficient for people to donate based on altruism because if I know I'm infected with hepatitis, I'm not going to go donate blood. But if I'm being paid to donate blood and I know I have hepatitis, I still might do it meaning that the compensation might be enough that it makes me think, ah, I'm going to go trick them, donate the infected blood because I need the money. One of the other problems of the system that we had in the U.S. is we were, we were relying primarily on blood donated by poor people. And so this research was influential enough that um, in the U.S. we stopped doing compensated blood donations. And we can still collect all the blood we need but uh, we don't need to pay donors anymore. And part of the benefit of that is it also reduces the amount of infected blood that's donated, which makes it less expensive for the system to accept donated blood. And so when you think about it, there are a lot of circumstances, and we'll talk about some in class and try to think of some examples, where you get a better outcome trusting people to be generous rather than paying them for what they're doing. And then the last idea I want us to talk about is Rosenberg's rule. So this is not an idea that's unique or original to this person, Rosenberg, but I'm giving him credit because it was my first time encountering it. Um, he was a, uh, th this person, Rosenberg, was a, I forget his first name, but he was a professional fundraiser in the Bay Area. And one of the ways he was effective in encouraging people to, to donate was by teaching them this concept. And the basic idea of this concept is that the, the problems of the world tend to grow at a faster rate than the return on invested dollars. Um, one example of this, so I me I've mentioned in class that I am, uh, I'm on the board of the Boys and Girls Club of Utah County. And the things that we prevent or the social problems we solve are pretty straightforward. Um, kids are at risk when they're home alone. And so we try to make it, we try to minimize those risks. The risks that they face by being home alone are that they're less likely to graduate from high school less likely to go to college, they're more likely to commit crimes, and they're more likely to do drugs. And so to increase high school graduation rates and attendance and to reduce crime and to reduce drugs, we encourage kids to participate in the Boys and Girls Club. If they do, and this is pretty robust research, if they do, those rates, all those rates improve in the right directions. And so the idea is, well, you could give to a um, Boys and Girls Club, and it would allow more kids to participate. And that's true for the Boys and Girls Club of U Utah County. We are always oversubscribed. We always have a waiting list. If we had more resources, we could take more kids. And that's just the truth of it. <clears throat> and so let's pretend you're starting off today with $1,000. Well, with $1,000, you could get a kid through half of high school participating in the Boys and Girls Club. That's how much it would cost over a couple of years of this kid participating in these in our programs. <clears throat> That's an average cost of attendance um, over a two-year period. And so if this kid was participating in the Boys and Girls Club, he's less likely to commit crimes. He's less likely to do drugs. Think about how much of the cost to society is saved as a, as a result of that. He's also more likely to graduate from high school, more likely to go to college. Think of the benefits that come to society because of that outcome. So $1,000 today means that kid gets in. Now, you don't have to donate today. Your other option is to take that $1,000 and invest it today. And, and, and if you invest it, then 20 years from now, you could take the re returns of that investment and give that to the Boys and Girls Club. 
Well, the question is, which is growing faster? Is your investment growing faster or are the problems that you could have prevented today growing faster? Well, these numbers I've chosen are just illustrative. They don't really actually, they're not based on any research. And I think I'm actually being kind of generous to the return on capital and and less generous to the cost of social ills growing. But the basic idea is this. If you had $1,000 invested today over a 20-year period at 10%, you're going to get $6,700 back. But during that same time period, if the social problem, like the kid who doesn't graduate from high school, who goes, to, who commits crimes, who does drugs, the co- if the cost of his problems grow at 20% a year, then it goes up to $38,000. And this illustrates what happens. If we don't solve problems today, they tend to grow faster than invested dollars do. So as a general rule where a nonprofit is having impact, is better to give today than it is later with invested money. The $1,000 today has a higher impact than the $6,700 does 20 years from now. In fact, if you wanted to cover the relative difference, you would have had to come up with another 30, let's see, what is that, $32,000 to make up the difference. And so this is an important concept with altruism because our instinct to give today is an instinct that's actually economically supported because Fundamentally, Rosenberg's rule is right, that social problems tend to grow faster than the return on investment does. So anyway, that gets us through session two of our altruism and economics discussion, and I'll see you all in class.